Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Clinic Gym Radio. And this is actually the first episode of 2020. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Satterley, and it's my pleasure to be joined today by Dr. Craig Levinson. Craig, happy new year to you. And how are you? I'm fantastic. Happy new year, Josh. I can't believe I get to inaugurate the new decade with you. <laughs> yes, just it's like a magic wand. You know, you're blessed from here on out, I guess. As am I. As am I. Uh, yeah. So, Craig, uh, you are a chiropractor based in um, in Los Angeles. That sentence does not do nearly enough. That's like saying a Rembrandt is just some oil on a piece of canvas. Uh, you are one of the more, uh, oh, what would I say, more progressive, forward-thinking, um, future-looking chiros in the whole world. You published about uh, exercise and rehab long before it was cool. You were like that guy at a party that says that he saw Foo Fighters at, you know, on sunset at a tiny little club while you're on your way to a massive uh, Foo Fighters concert 20 years later. You, you knew the stuff before it was cool, huh? I was really lucky. Um, I think I was a skeptic when I went to chiropractic school and uh, it just gave me an open mind. So I always thought outside the box. Yeah, because uh, for those who don't know, your history was not actually in like biology or anatomy or anything, if I remember right, right? You came into chiropractic college with a degree in what? Philosophy. <laughs> awesome. Which always leaves the best. Actually, the, the valedictorian of my class, I believe, had a master's of art history when she came into school. And I, I think it works because there's no preconceived notions of what should work. You know, everything had to prove it to you. Well, I also had... Uh, numerous chiropractic interactions um, and none of them left me feeling um, like I wanted to become a chiropractor, but I decided to become a chiropractor yeah. anyway. And why the hell did you do it? <laughs> I don't know. Well, that's great. I was lost. What can I say? You know, finishing awesome. school with a philosophy degree, they're, they're not banging down your door offering <laughs> you, offering you a six figure you know, contracts. Well, unfortunately for philosophy degrees in the eighties, they weren't offering a lot of five figure contracts either. Right. <laughs> no. We have an internship at the summer camp. You're welcome to volunteer for. It's like, Oh, great. Yeah. You can keep reading on your own. Your degree's over. <laughs> <laughs> right. That was more like it. Well, for those, uh, speaking of reading, those of you, the people listening that want to, uh, maybe learn a little bit about your approach and what you do, you actually published a, a tiny little, I mean, it's a tiny textbook on the idea of rehab and chiropractic, right? I mean, it's only got to be, what, 4,000 pages or something? Uh, collectively between the three editions. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, you just put out the third edition, and can you give every the title and kind of what to expect in that book? Sure. It's uh, Rehab of the Spine, uh, third edition. Um, it has a new new overall title. Uh, we pivoted from Rehab of the Spine, a practitioner's um, manual, uh, to Rehab of the Spine, a patient-centered approach. Uh, and that reflects uh, really a lot of changes in the last, I'd say, uh, 12 years. Okay. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, we now understand what uh, the social of biopsychosocial is a little bit better. I think, <laughs> I think it was in name only. Uh, yeah. And that was to our disservice because it led to an unnecessary friction between the bio and the psycho or the biomechanics and the pain science fields, which the internet has just polarized in a very unhelpful way. Um, yeah. It's uh, ironic that social media is yeah. in your as well, right? <laughs> I love like that. Anti-social media. Yeah, and, and I never knew what the social was. I, I couldn't figure it out. And, and, and of course, uh, the new book is really all about context and environment, which is uh, the milieu, which um, we need to be aware of in order to be able to meet people empathetically uh, where they're at. And that's the only way to change them. Because rehab, they're not passive, <laughs> The chiropractic adjustment, people are passive. Um, mm -hmm. We need to get their confidence. But rehab, we need more than their confidence. Uh, we need them to be confident when they're not in the room with us. Right. That's, and, that's an interesting uh, approach. And so uh, it has to do with uh, their support system and, and where they're going to do the self-care and things like that. So That's awesome. Well, hey, uh, so for those listening, uh, you are a very progressive guy, as I said before. 
Uh, what is one thought that you truly believed at the core of writing the first edition that you now believe is wrong? You know, where have you progressed in some, some regard or, or a tool that you thought was silly day one and now you think, uh, man, I, I would never be without. So I remember going to a Perform Better the first time, oh man, let's say nine years ago and I saw Indian clubs and I thought, what are these silly fools doing with these clubs? I mean, is this like a ballet dance going on here? Is it like rhythmic gymnastics? And then uh, now I think they're incredible. I think they're an incredible tool. They're super fun. They're engaging. You, you're fully invested. Like when you are swinging Indian clubs, at least in my mind, you are not thinking about your grocery list or uh, anything else. You are fully invested in that. I love those for that. Um, know, well, before I answer... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> if I come out in February to see Annie O'Connor and 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 Jan uh, Hurt Hurtkinson at the Parker program, uh, I want an Indian club session with you. <laughs> oh, Jesus, no, you, no, you don't. You don't want it with me. It's like don't take golf lessons from me. And don't take Indian clubs lessons from me. Either one of them, you have a very high risk of getting hit. Okay, I don't care. <laughs> I'll step back. Uh, two novices together. That that's the way to learn. Um, First edition, what did I get wrong? It's easier to answer the second edition. I, I okay. actually yeah. now, here's, here's the irony. Now I'm realizing that I have forgotten the most um, applicable, practical components that help solve not what rehab is, but how to apply rehab. So I think I had it more right uh, in the first edition. And I think in the eclecticism of the second edition, as we became, like you said, through social media, uh, inundated with so much information, um, it became very hard to integrate. And I think we lost our way. I think specifically what I got wrong in in 2006, 2007, um, is that we became mesmerized with motor control. And uh, as it turns out, when I think back to what I learned from Professor Yonda, Professor Yonda knew that people will not comply. They ain't taking it home. If you're making it too complicated, right. uh, you can be right and be wrong. Like Feldenkrais said, it's incorrect to correct. So John Wooden, uh, the, the hmm. great coach from UCLA, he said, don't give correction if it causes resentment. And the coaches had it right. The trainers and physical therapists, I think, all got it wrong. And the new third edition, the patient-centered approach, as opposed to a practitioner's manual, is about uh, giving it back to the individual, which hmm. is what Yonda knew because he lived in a communist world. And in a communist world, the, the number one complaint laid at the feet of, of rehab is, is that people won't comply. How will they adhere? How can you motivate them? How can you change their behavior? Um, which is why chiropractors don't do it. They just want to fix things. Um, and it makes sense. But Yonda said, since people aren't motivated, we shouldn't try to change their behavior. We should reset their nervous system. And the way he did it was through gamification. And that's how coaches uh, function. They create environment conducive to motor learning. It's not about motor control. So the third edition is all about behavioral modification and motor learning and skill acquisition, which we know is contingent on the environment that you set up. Like you talk, Josh, about setting up the right environment in a chiropractor's office. That is the home run. It's not about your knowledge. It's not about your skills. It's not what you know. It's about creating an environment where there's a grandmother in the, in the room lifting kettlebells or doing Indian bells, and then your fragilista, 35-year-old with fibromyalgia, comes in and they see that and they go, oh, can I do that? Whereas if that grandmother wasn't lifting a kettlebell, that, that 35-year-old fragilista would, would, say, would, would say, you're not going to give me exercise, are you? I don't want heavy weights because they'll make me bulky. Well, even worse, I, I don't want to lift a weight. I'll hurt myself. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It's like that. Uh, what's the song? Hold on loosely, but don't let go. If you, if you hold on, if you hold too tight, you're going to let go. I can't remember who sings it, but that's mean, a guidebook, right? You mean like holding a peach? Yeah, there you go. A really ripe peach where you can get the skin off of it in a half a second. So isn't, isn't that uh, how we, how we're supposed to learn how to palpate? 
yeah. like it's a peach. That that's, that's so, a metaphor for all this. I love how you just tied that in, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't bring in eighty songs, you know, it really isn't that clear. That's, so let me uh, let me ask you this. I mean, it's so talking about the biopsychosocial, being a social practitioner and uh, being you know around your peers and seeing your peers on social media and and seeing their accolades and their abilities and all those things drives us, I think, to want to be the quote unquote solution to these people's problems, right? And, and, and go for the control or the hands-on or the idea of, I fix this, the practitioner fix this, not the participant or the patient. And, uh, and I think that that is oftentimes hard to overcome. Um, so how did you deal with that? Being a, a guy that has an encyclopedic knowledge of all this stuff, how'd you get comfortable with being like, accepting the fact that you weren't the solution. You might be were a guide or a teacher, but you weren't the, the one. I think the realization of the fact that things are very complex. We're dealing with, with things like motivation and behavior change. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't just snap your finger and have somebody do what you prescribe. It's, it's not homework. Um, it's a process of building trust through, uh, you know, we're at the new year, people are making these silly resolutions right now. And we know that they don't work. But what it is about is it's about goals. Well, come on, I can, I can run a 200 miler in six weeks. From now. <laughs> Give me a break. Um, it's, it's about listening to people. So this is the motivational interviewing and the empathy that sets the stage. And, and, and when we establish a relatable goal, um, then it's a journey and we're together through the ups and downs. It's not about having the answer. Uh, a good program takes time. It's not about instant results. And, and this was another one of the things that I got wrong. Um, I really thought that we should seek, uh, and I still think we should seek it uh, within session change, but I realized that within session change is often fool's gold. And that, okay. and that, and that rea in reality, um, the analgesic effect of within session change is often a placebo and doesn't necessarily get to the, the upstream sources. And, and people realize that, that they're in a turbulent state and to make a change that, that, that success doesn't come overnight. Um, and, and you can't really see yourself as a fix-it person. You want to see yourself as a partner and as a guide. We're in an era where we're moving beyond fix-it to lifestyle change. And, and we have to because people are getting older, younger now. 50-year-olds today are more compromised than they were ever before in history because of our lifestyle, because we eat too much and move too little. It, it's not just that people are living longer and we need to have them functioning when they're 80. That's part of it. But the other part that's more tragic is that at 50, people have more arthritis, more disability, more mental health issues, uh, more diabetes. Uh, because of our lifestyle and lifestyle change, you can't change that in a fix it approach that this is chiropractic has an opportunity, but we will, um, we will miss the boat if we make the same mistake as allopaths. Well, I hope people are listening and are thinking, All right, I'm not going to miss the boat because we have previously missed a few other boats that have sailed by us. But, uh, there were beautiful cruise ships that sailed by us with unlimited buffets and whatnot. No. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I, a, I don't think there's ever been a better time in the history of the, I'll say, United States, where our license, our skill set is better able to handle um, a massive situation, whether you want to look at the opioid crisis or epidemic. Or if you want to just look at what you're saying, the, the, the inherent lack of activity that's leading to what previously would be disease states, but are just normalcy now, you know, um, lack of movement and, and lack of range of motion and, or whatever you want to say, just bodies wearing out, I'm sorry, uh, uh, rusting out basically instead of wearing out. Uh, so as you see that, I always, always love this, this thought. When you graduated, well, I'll just give you my take on this and then I would love to know yours since you've seen a few more um a few more sunsets than I have uh when I graduated in 06 from what we know is the greatest chiropractic college ever 
uh, <laughs> ever established, which is Los Angeles College of Chiropractic. It, it's not SCUS. <laughs> <laughs> It, that just doesn't have the the sexiness of uh, Los Angeles Chiro- College of Chiropractic, but whatever you want to call it. Uh, when I graduated in 06, it was, uh, you had to have some adjusting skills and it was kind of new, but kind of cool to have like a uh, soft tissue management strategy. So there are a lot of people like active release technique who are um, marketing to that and, and, you know, motivated people to get a, you know, soft tissue technique to use throughout the whole body. And then as I progressed, it was like, oh, wow, that's cool. Uh, It would also be cool to learn some rehab. And so learn some rehab from some folks that, uh, like yourself and some other folks that uh, saw that advantageous. And I would say that that change came about in like 2000, let's say 15. And now, uh, you know, I teach at Cleveland Chiropractic College as an adjunct. And a lot of those students have tons of knowledge of rehab, surprisingly to me, but not surprising to them. And I love it. And they're starting to go after the exercise. Um, if you were, you know, go back in time to when you graduated. I mean, when you were talking about rehab or Yonda, people must have been like, they must have tr- corrected you and said Yonda because <laughs> they were so yeah, out of touch. They yeah. couldn't even yeah, say duh. the name. Yeah. Duh. <laughs> yeah. But I would love to know uh, also what you see off in the future. Like what will be the skill set of the kind of rank and file uh, chiropractor if we're going to... Um, not miss this boat. Oh, wow. Oh, I love how you brought that around. So, so let's go back first. Like when, when yeah. did you see these transitions and yeah, you know. when I started off, um, it was kind of a blank slate. So Yonda was all but ignored by the physios. Okay. And I was fortunate. I was learning about NIMO and soft tissues. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wasn't just a bone and joint guy. And I started chiropractic school because I uh, was more interested in in nutrition than anything else. Really? And realized that the biomechanics were also important and that chiropractic had a role to play. So, you know, the Wilk trial was settled. The uh, AMA and American Hospital Association were found guilty of, of antitrust violation, trying to monopolize healthcare. They'd suppressed evidence of chiropractic's effectiveness that was 40 years old in the, in the U.S. Army. Um, the Rand Corporation convened. This is all when I'm in school in the 80s. Uh, they brought together a think tank at Rand to look at spinal manipulative therapy. Um, and, you know, there was a recognition that spinal manipulative therapy was part of the answer. Um, so at that moment, you know, I'm feeling good that I made this choice to go to chiropractic school. And I realized it wasn't just about nutrition, that the chiropractic side uh, was, 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 was potent. Um, but I was fortunate to have uh, a buddy who also was at Western States. And he, was, he started a year before me and he was feeding me information. He said, hey, look at NIMO, look at soft tissues, look at osteopathy. And so my mind was opened early on and I got exposed to Len Fay. I got exposed to the soft tissues and, and that led me to a broad approach where I knew the muscles and joints were important. Um, And then I realized that it wasn't just the tight muscle or the, or the trigger points or or soft tissue lesions. It was also the weak muscles. And furthermore, it was the faulty movement patterns. And that's what brought it full circle back to, to the nervous system because the faulty movement patterns is the motor control and the coordination and the CNS. And so the one group that put it all together was the Prague school. And just, I mean, this is back before the internet, like how the hell did you find them, find anything about them? <laughs> I read, how to reach them. I read, I read, I read. Okay. We had, we had, I had, I found. I mean, was there just some classified ad in the back of like, my, like no, philosophers a, uh, monthly or whatever that like want to study about the human body? You know, you know it's Check true. Check out Prague. <laughs> no, it's true because people were ignoring Levitt and Yonda. And, and so here was the deal. My friend turned me on to osteopathic literature, namely um, Irvin Kaur. And Core had written about the um, uh, had written about the spinal cord as organizer of disease processes. A series of like six papers, all about the tro- trophic function of nerves, about the neurological lens and segmental facilitation. Now, is this while you're cord. still in school, or you? This is like, I'm in second term. This is oh my god. This, so you're this, this is segmental facilitation, <laughs> all about the straight chiropractic stuff of how you can get um, a spillover from. 
uh, different tissues that share the same innervation. Um, it awesome. was, and so Core had written a book called Neurobiologic Mechanisms of Manipulative Therapy from a meeting at Michigan State University, which was a follow-up to the original NINS conference in the late 60s. And that book, the first two chapters were by Levitt and Yonda. Wow. So let's just put the timeline together here. You're sitting there in chiropractic college, what, 85? 83. 83, 83, 83. You're reading a book that was published in, I'm going to guess, 80s, based upon a conference. The follow-up conference had to be mid-70s, early 70s? Late 70s. Late 70s from the original conference that was in the 60s. Yeah. So at this moment, you are reading information that was quote-unquote cutting edge, but in fact is 20, 20 years old? Well, Levitt and Yonda's work started in the, in the um, early 1960s, late 50s. Okay. And they started studying chiropractic manipulation, osteopathic manipulation, but also exercise. They put it all together. It was about the joints, uh, the muscles, the faulty movement patterns, and the nervous system. And so nothing has really changed. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. Levitt's, Levitt's understanding of the psychology was, was perfect. Um, he understood that if somebody was mistreated, that they would become uh, depressed or anxious. Uh, and their state of mind would affect their movement patterns. They would develop a sympathetic nervous system reaction and hypertonus. Uh, and then they would not want to move because they would have fear of movement. And so they would develop secondary inhibition and weakness. I love this because only at that moment could that have developed. Uh, because I don't know if you ever read, um, there's a book, Zero to One, with Peter Thiel, one of the founders of PayPal. And Peter Thiel says, if you want to solve a problem, he's like, forget this think outside the box idea. Think inside the box. Think about the, the constraints you have and find a solution to the problem within that. And I always think it's a good, you know, for like people that want to start exercising people in their office, think inside the box. Think about what you already have and what you, the space you already have. Like you don't need to build a whole gym. If you're a great trainer. You don't need any equipment for a, a great workout. Think inside your box. But it's funny that at that moment, if they had not been in a communist, actively communist country, with all the limitations applied therein, they probably would not have ended up at movement, right? Like the, in the US, we solve it by finding a technological answer to the problem or building a new MRI machine or hey, the CT got much better. We went from a one Tesla to you know, three Tesla magnet in our MRI. Like all those things are great, but they were constrained by the fact that they are in a communist country. And so they didn't have a lot of options. And also I'm sure that the, um, when you're talking about the biopsychosocial, it's fairly well controlled in a communist country because you don't have the freedom to pursue whatever you want. So no, none understand. of them, none of them had, were motivated. So Yanda yeah. had to come up with a way to get people's uh, uh, to get people more active again. Yeah, yeah. it's no. great. My wife did a study on folate where she was a participant. And they said, the first six weeks, we deplete you of all folate, and then we add it back in your diet and see the reaction. <laughs> That's what they've done. They said, we're going to deplete you of all motivation, and then we're going to induce some motivation and see what happens with these patients, right? <laughs> Figure out how to reboot the nervous system in yeah. people that have absolutely no hope. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. So, so you hear about these guys. You read about them in this, the, the, you said the forward of the book, of the textbook was written by? Well, the first two chapters at okay. the conference. And Yonda wasn't even allowed to go because they knew if he went, uh, he wouldn't come back, he'd defect. Right. So you went, how'd you go from that to the first time your feet hit the soil in Prague? Oh, gosh. All right. So uh, I mid -80s, first- 80s, right? 83, 85. Yeah. So I, 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 by the time I graduated, I had already um, written them and invited them to come to, to LACC. Uh, Levitt sits Which, by on, the way, for those people listening, literally wrote it. Like, literally wrote a letter on paper, yeah. right? Because there was no email or text. No, I read, it was all letters. I, have, I still have the letters from both of them, uh, many of them. And, and Levitt sat on my letter for two years before responding uh, because of anti-chiropractic uh, sentiment. Wow, okay. And uh, he was in Australia. He saw uh, Philip Greenman, the great osteopath. And Phil had a connection uh, with, um, with me and with Alan Adams, who had come down from CMCC to be one of the deans at LACC. And Phil told uh, Levitt that LACC was, uh, was a safe zone. <laughs> awesome. A safe space, as they call it. <laughs> and... Um, Levitt responded, said he'd love to come. Now, meanwhile, he thought I was a professor. He didn't know I was a student. <laughs> yeah. 
And when he came, he refused to talk about the humility of this man and his service uh, qualities. Um, He refused the check that I gave him from this This body. This is Professor Levitt. Yep. He okay. came in 1987. I handed him a check, and when he when he realized that we were students hosting him, uh, he refused the check, even though this check man was um, from a communist country where obviously they didn't make a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, that's the honor of him, and that changed my life. The, to, that act, not that act, but but everything together, like that was part of who he was. Okay. Um, and it was consistent with the open-mindedness. These are two neurologists who, as you said perfectly, were trapped behind the Iron Curtain, so they didn't have the technology post-World War II that we had mm-hmm. in the West. So they learned in France from, from the French School of Neurology, the School of, Le, of Pasteur and Lesseig and Dijerain, and they were still carrying forward this fine science and art of the physical exam and the history-taking. Uh, and, they, and for 40 years... Uh, they were still inculcating all this while they were studying osteopathy and chiropractic and exercise. Wow. It was all it was all part of the package. Man, thank God he didn't sit on your letter for three years. You would have been out of school and there would have been no contact, right? Like, <laughs> so he man. so he fi- so so they came numerous times. Levitt was already an older older person, and Levitt finally said, "I'm not coming anymore. Um, you have to come here." And that was before the Berlin Wall fell. But in 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. And within three months in 1990, I was, I was in Prague. And at this time, because I know uh, at this moment in history, so we're recording this early 2000, 2020, really early in 2020, folks have gone to Prague for these, uh, you know, like uh, DNSD, I think, is always in Prague, right? And, yes. and these other things. There was no formalized program, I'm guessing, when you showed up on uh, the Czech soil. You, it was like, hey, I'm Craig. I'm just going to watch for a while. Well, I went <laughs> and I watched for a while. I saw Dr. Levitt at, at the Central Railway Health Institute clinic where he worked, and I saw him treat 50 patients. Uh, the first patient blew my mind, um, and I took notes on the subsequent 49 patients. Um, That's awesome. I would love to get some perspective. I, I uh Please take this in the spirit which is intended. I remember, you ever gone to Glacier National Park? Yes. You ever gone to the top of going to the Sun Road? No. Which It's the big road through Glacier National Park. If anyone listening ever goes there, there's just one main road that goes through the whole thing, goes to the top of this peak. And when you look down in this valley, there's these huge buses passing you. They're huge. They are the most minuscule dot when you're up on top of that mountain looking down and seeing that red dot. And you realize how small you are in this world that of creation. Like you are an ant, right? I would just, pers- I'm just sitting there thinking here you are the most progressive guy, you know, right? I mean, like on the U S soil, you're this young, like wacky freaking studying these ideas that nobody is talking about in chiropractic, right? At the university, I'm sure you're pushing the, 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 you're pushing the progress so far forward that people are like, wow, this guy is so cutting edge. And then you go to Prague and it's like, whoosh, all of a sudden, you go from the, the, for lack of a better term, you would never describe yourself as this, but the smartest guy in the room to the ant, right? Like, in, in those observations, I'm sure it just totally refocused your, your sights. Am I, am I close to what the emotional effect was of, of watching him work that first time? Well, I think the context, the context is interesting. As you already implied before, um, Back at LACC, when I was when I was studying this and I was inviting these people to come, there was very little interest. So we had people. You're talking about were, gasoline before anybody owned a car, right? Like I mean, we we had people coming when I had Levitt come in '87. We had people that were outliers that came from all over the country, but nobody from LACC came. We had no faculty in the room. We had 350 people in a sold out auditorium. Half of them were well, not half. Three quarters were students from New York, from Palmer, um, and and there was not one faculty member from LACC. When I was in the clinic before Levitt came in '87, uh, I was not allowed to do the things I wanted to do. I had to do the same thing that students have to do today. I had to meet the ultrasound requirements, and I was uh, uh, I'm, I'm a rebel. I've always been a rebel, and I was 
Thank God you are, man. I was willing to play along. Like I knew I had to do those requirements, but I was actually inside vehemently opposed to the imposition of a non-evidence-based requirement. Um, uh, That made me bristle. Um, And so I came up with a system back then to help uh, my clinicians understand the logic of what I was doing. I called it um, um, AIM, not A-I-M, but but advice manipulation exercise. So I got them to allow me to give everybody advice, then manipulation, and then exercise. Um, And it also helped me to frame what I was doing so everything had a place. Like I knew I had to deal with the person's anxieties and reassure them. That's the advice. And then give them some hands-on uh, to gain their trust and, and make them feel better, placebo or otherwise, whether it was, you know, really doing something was besides the point. I'm sure it was doing something, though. And then the exercise, I had to give them something to do for themselves, self-management. So this was this all going on. this is in on. the clinic as a student? This was in the clinic, yeah. But when I was, before I was in the clinic, when I was just- You talk about upstream, uh, <laughs> upstream modulation, my man. That was it, right? Well, b- yeah. And before that, when I was in the classroom, I was inviting speakers and telling people about other stuff. Nobody cared. Yeah. I mean, I was- You're only 20 years ahead of your time at that moment. I mean, come on, give them a little grace, buddy. <laughs> um, I was okay with You come with that. back from Mars and talking about like flying at lot- light speed and they're like, well, hold on, we're- I got a really fast Ferrari and you're like, I know you think that's cool. Any of that cool. Well, you know, when you see something that has a certain resonance, you recognize that it's, it's uh, a more efficient and potent paradigm. But since I studied philosophy, I, my, my focus in philosophy was philosophy of science and the structure of scientific revolutions. And we know that when there is a scientific paradigm shift that um, it takes a few generations You have people of tenure who have vested interests and they will, they will have cognitive dissonance. They will have blindness. So, so I understood all that, that that's just part, part of, part of it. That's part of the purpose of tenure, right? Is to give them the feeling of safety. So they don't have to grow. Changing world. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, if they didn't feel safe, they would just, they would never hire the new guy because they'd, be like, no, he's going to, I can see this. He's going to take my job. He's talking about ideas that I'm not even. I only want to be surrounded by the new guys. I only yeah. want to, you say four generations. I, I, that's interesting. I, I can see that. And, and the new, the fourth generation since I graduated, that's who I want to be surrounded by right now because awesome. that keeps me on my toes because they're reframing and they're asking me even better questions than the third generation or second or first generation uh, yeah. since I graduated did. So let's go back to that because I totally, uh, I deviated here and I would love to hear about your experience that first day in, uh, in Prague observing, but I want to go to what do you, th- back to this question, what do you think the skill set of the uh, practitioners on the boat, <laughs> I'm going to get you a hat, one of those captain's hats, with, you know, so you can be like with the, with the scrambled eggs on the brim. Like, you'll you'll and, give uh, me that after I do the, the clubs with you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You'll have a black eye and a bruise on your shoulder. Like, what'd you do? Oh, I practice Indian clubs with Josh. Yeah. So, uh, so what do you think the skill set will will some of the skill sets will be in the future? I mean, we'll never know, but uh, what do you think they'll be? Motivational interviewing. Okay. Motivational interviewing. If I can reach six feet to the right, there's a a book over there called Motivational Interviewing for Behavioral healthcare. Behavioral Psychology. Okay. Game theory, uh, chaos theory, complex systems theory, dynamic systems theory. Okay. Uh, uh, gamification. Well, you just outlined the first year of every chiropractic college, so we're okay. <laughs> hey, are you looking for the best exercise equipment available? Well, I think that you got to check out Perform Better. PerformBetter.com is a huge supporter of everything that is the Clinic Gym Hybrid. You know, they are actually one of the biggest supporters of the FMS and the SFMA program. And I can't say enough great things about their three-day summit. So if you're interested in some education every summer, they do their three-day summits in Orlando, Chicago, Providence, and Long Beach. Long Beach is my favorite. That's where I go. But the speakers there will absolutely blow your mind. So check out performbetter.com, whether you need bands, mini bands, equipment, flooring, or their 3D design capabilities. I think it's fantastic stuff. So check out performbetter.com. So let's dissect those a little bit. Uh, Gamification. Mm -hmm. For those who 
maybe understand the concept, but don't understand how to put it into healthcare or don't understand the concept. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and, and how you use that within patient interaction? Yes. So funny you should ask me since you're in Vegas where game theory really <laughs> is born, but, but it's moved into marketing. So at the supermarket, having things at end aisle display or at, by the cash register, that's game theory. Game theory is the intersection of economics and psychology. So it's all about changing behavior in the easiest way possible. And what we know is that if you explain to somebody why they should do something, that doesn't help at all because it's right. game theory is not a rational process. This is subconscious. So uh, linking uh, your goal of behavior change to something logical or rational will fail. Uh, what we've learned is we need to create uh, uh, bumpers or barriers, and these are nudges that 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 guide people and steer them towards the choices that are probably in their best interest. So, as an example, uh, I do a lot of partner exercise. I have a lot of variety of toys in the office. We focus on making it fun. We do reactive training, and this is where I said the big change. When you said, what have I done wrong in the first edition? Really, the first edition was more right than the second. The second had huh. a lot of cool, fancy toys, DNS and this and that. But in reality, the mistake of the second edition is I forgot Yonda. I forgot that Yonda was not a motor control guy. He was a motor learning guy. He was more like a coach, like John Wooden. It was about skill acquisition. And, and he had to do it that way because people weren't motivated. Motor control requires you're doing correctives and telling them what they're doing wrong. And then they have to think about, oh, my hand should be here and my shoulder should be here. And, and in gamification, we don't do anything rational. It's all involuntary. It's all reactive. So if you want somebody to squat better, you do what Pavel Satsilin taught in the very first video, Return of the Kettlebell, where he said, um, uh, stand against the wall. Now squat down. The wall shall be your coach. And what did the wall do? The window pane squat made it so a person naturally maintained a more neutral lumbar spine. Hmm. Wouldn't stoop or bend at the waist or drive their knees forward. Yet he never said, don't drive your knees forward. Don't bend at the waist. He just let the wall be the coach. So that's gamification is finding the path of least resistance. And that's what Yonda did. And that's motor learning and skill acquisition and coaching, and that's not motor control. So motor control was the big mistake of the second edition. I, I did a huge deep immersion, and that's also the difference between DNS and Levitt and Yonda. DNS is from Voita. Voita left Prague in 1968. Um, uh, Kolaj was never a student of Levitt or Yonda's. They were interested in him because his work is fascinating. Uh, about ontogenesis, uh, but he was not studying their work. He was a student of Voita's. And, and where did he go in 1968? By the way, because he had to defect somewhere, right? He he did it. He didn't. It was the Prague Spring. The Russian tanks were rolling in, and a lot of people escaped. Okay. So uh, uh, technically, I wouldn't call it an act of defection. Uh, it was an escape, and he escaped to to Switzerland. Okay. Well, it and, didn't go too far, huh? But and he form, formed the, the Voigt Institute in Germany and then later in Italy where um, he had some girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, <laughs> uh, it was a different time. It was a different time. All right. So, uh, I don't remember where we went. So, all right. So, in the skill set of the future what, practitioner. What, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Yes. <laughs> what happens in Rome I think Italy had that long before we did, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you're, so that's, you're, so that's gamification. It's making it fun and, and not overcorrecting. And it's the difference in learn, motor learning and motor control. Right. So the idea of becoming a better coach, not in correcting the movement, we don't, I'm trying to avoid the word correction here, but, um, quote unquote, fixing the movement, but going for the end goal, which is what a good coach does is score the points but you're going to allow a lot of different methods for that. Yeah. As long as we're scoring points. Yeah. But we're not going to allow you to just, uh, you, you know, in golf, like use a training, lay an alignment rod on the ground every shot you take. Like that's a ridiculous idea. Yeah. If you look at, at darts, uh, there's a million different ways to hit the target. There's not one way. Right. So, but you still want to win. You still so, want to make it fun and interesting. Yeah, you create constraints like using wickets to teach better footwork, quick feet, 
and change of direction ability. It gamifies uh, gamifies the the sharp uh, 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 force production that's required uh, to to transfer the energy. All right, so we have this <laughs> gamification. No, I'm I'm. And fun. It's got to be. It's got to be fun. That's yeah. That was Yonda's gift that we all forgot. Mm. <laughs> Everybody saw his tests. Like, oh, they're shrugging. So uh, don't shrug your shoulders. Bring your shoulders back and down. Oh, they're poking their chin. Don't poke your chin. Tuck your chin in. Yonda didn't do any of that. He showed us what to see. He he taught us how to evaluate movement. But he never. He was like Feldenkrais. He never. He always actually taught in line with Feldenkrais that it's incorrect to correct. He wanted us to see it, but, but he wanted us to create an environment where it corrected on its own. And at the end of the day, it really wasn't about winning the exercise. That's the mistake. It's about winning what you just said, the adaptation. It's scoreboard. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned like it's exciting and whatnot. You know, a coach is excited by winning. And when you, at least my experience has been when you provide that environment where there's change that occurs without you having to be the creator of that change, if you create the environment, it is so much more fun for everybody involved yourself too, right? I mean, I'm going to guess that your enjoyment level at the end of a day now, knowing everything you know, and probably performing, I would guess less direct patient intervention than you did back at the beginning of your career the enjoyment is also higher. Like, like the reward, the, um, I don't know how to say it, but like what coach K feels like at the end of a, a winning Kentucky basketball game, right? Like it's, it's, it's the reward for the practitioner is higher as well. This isn't like a, cause I think a lot of people go into this, uh, this is like a philosoph- philosophical talk, I guess, but go into chiropractic because they inherently like people. They like helping people and they inherently like using their hands to do so. And sometimes they think that that the reward comes from the using of your of your hands, providing the manipulation or the correction of the soft tissue. And now you're saying we're going to remove some of that to create this learning environment, but the reward will not go away with that. I still do manual therapy. I I, I enjoy using my hands. I I always will. But the highest value thing is to to empower a person to to self care. Uh, people can't afford necessarily um, to keep coming back and you want to get to the source of the source. Mm -hmm. And so in an era where we have a a rising tide of non-communicable diseases and people living longer and, and getting sicker, younger, uh, we want to promote lifestyle change. So if you think of snaps, smoking, nutrition, alcohol, physical activity, stress, social participation, and sleep, how are we going to motivate people to change their lifestyle? We know that probably 70%, 80% of health, uh, health span, lifespan depends upon these lifestyle determinants. Um, And uh, physical activity is at the the center of all of them. Physical activity is is the keystone. Um, And if you lay your hands on people, people attribute to that. McKenzie said, there's nothing wrong with manual therapy, but if you want to change behavior, you have to show a person what to do for themselves first. So they attribute to themselves. All we want is people to develop an internal locus of control. So that it's simple. The process is simple. Show people what to do for themselves first. Then the icing on the cake is you, 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 you do some manual therapy for their kinks. The other thing about manual therapy is I think people need to earn manual therapy. Manual therapy isn't, isn't best for a fibromyalgic or chronic pain patient. That's the fool's gold. Those people need to exercise. They think hurt equals harm and they shouldn't exercise, but they're underprepared and now they're overprotecting. So, so once they have a positive experience with movement, their cortisol changes, uh, they start to, to shed some of that rust you talked about and the motion is the lotion. Um, but conversely, uh, the people who really need the manual therapy are your athletes. When somebody has trained hard, now they need recovery. So when they're stressing the body with load, 
Uh, now, in order to be able to benefit from that adaptive stimulus again and sooner, which is what a steroid would help a person to do, but we call that cheating, the best mm-hmm. performance enhancer other than sleep would be some sort of tissue work and skilled tissue work, not on a foam roll, but by a chiropractor, by a skilled manual therapist. And, and, and that's the more appropriate use. We see that with Kawhi Leonard. We see it with LeBron James. Um, they've earned the recovery. And, and manual therapy is part of what Kawhi gets at the end of every game. Um, but for chronic pain patients, you've talked about the big opiate crisis. Uh, manual therapy isn't really getting upstream of the problem for people who are mm-hmm. fearful and apprehensive and think the tissue is the issue. That, that's a form of, of, of over-treatment. Mm-hmm. That, that's like medicalizing the problem. We think because it's natural that it's not medicalizing the problem. It's like taking an MRI when you shouldn't. It, it, it's over-detection of problems. It's over-diagnosis, and it leads to over-treatment. We want to empower people that it is safe and efficacious to resume near-normal activities. We want people to participate again in dancing and in yoga and in hiking and in tennis and in golf and, and, and the manual therapy, while effective, is not as effective as showing people what to do for themselves. That's the innate intelligence. Above, down, inside, out. <laughs> that to me, it is about the nervous system. Yeah. It's about the connection of the mind and the body. That's what innate intelligence is. It's not a dirty word. The evidence-based chiropractor has got it all wrong. I, I understand the pejorative nature of this and the politics. I, I, I don't care about politics. I care about knowledge. And <laughs> Philosophers I care, typically don't care about politics. Or they're not yeah, I never have. I, yeah. I care about changing patients and empowering. Yeah. I don't use the, the word subluxation. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, you know, I don't use the word innate intelligence with patients. I don't show them the, the, the picture of the, the spinal cord and going to all the viscera. Push this but, button and the light turns on thing. But I want to get to the source of the source. I want to get upstream. And I don't want them to think that the problem is that QL not. I want them to, to drop into a side plank and realize that the QL is, is, is sensitive and irritable because mm-hmm. it's underprepared. I'm taking a Tim Gabbett uh, uh, approach. I, I got to say the best part about doing podcasts is, you know, it's basically an, uh, one-on-one for an hour with somebody in, incredibly intelligent. Uh, and in the last minute or two minutes, you've changed my entire philosophy about the way, uh, when you said that soft tissue work or sorry, uh, manual therapy, they need to earn the right for manual therapy. I think that I really like the perspective that you just kind of framed for me, which is basically have them perform or try to perform an exercise and if there's a limitation in front of that, that's the perfect place for manual therapy. But manual therapy just given before the exercise is not nearly as, the, in, there's no learning environment there because they don't realize the limitation that whatever you're working on provided, therefore they won't realize the effect of that in their learning environment. And the reliance is upon the me as the provider rather than upon their movement. So just switching that order. Yeah, that that's just going to be a, what do they call that? A seismic shift in the way I treat patients. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> no, dude, it's awesome. This is, this is the best part about this. I mean, I don't, I don't know if the people listening picked up on that, but for, to me, that was the thing, you know, everybody will hear some a different message in this, but that for me was the thing. Well, it's, it's no. logical to do the manual therapy before exercise. I understand the logic. It's biomechanical model, nervous system model. If something is stuck, you know, unblock it before they exercise. Yeah. I, I, I get that. And, and that's not incorrect. But if we're thinking about change and transformation, mm-hmm. it's, all, it's all about the, the end game. And the, in, in the infinity game of, of Simon Sinek, the end game strategy is to motivate people. So my mission at LA Sports and Spine is to give people a positive experience with movement and to give them tangible hope and an achievable plan. And that's where, even though I'm a lover of Levitt and Yonda, and they're my mentors, uh, McKenzie was the greatest revolutionary in our space because he understood psychology best. And he, he put it simply, you know, if you get them out of pain, they're not going to 
do self-care. And, and things will recur, like musculoskeletal pain recurs. It's when you have a recurrent pain, it, it's, it's, you're going to get a cold again. Maybe it'll be more like even, um, you know, uh, allergies. And then when you medicalize these things, then people will keep reaching for the fix it. And we all know with chiropractic, the first adjustment, you know, lasts the longest. But when you go back into to that well, it doesn't last as long. Yeah. And finally, you feel good for 15 minutes. You know, and, hmm. and, and, and you're just going back for that feeling, that euphoria, uh, but it's not really changing anything. And why, yeah. why would it change anything? If you, don't have, uh, it, it, if you don't have the capacity to handle your demands, then, of course, the tissues are going to go into a compensatory state and hmm. become guarded and protective. And, and I think we're focused too much on the guarding and protection rather than, than the, 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 the lower, the, the poor preparation. It, it, it's not the load that breaks us down. It's a load we're not prepared for. And, and we're feeding the wrong beast. We keep focusing on the overactive and tight structures and blocked structures instead of why did they shut down? Strengthening is not inherently dangerous. We're going to find the path of least resistance, the hardest thing they do well. That's the gateway exercise. And it may be like Pavel Satsalin said, said, do your squats against a wall. Mm -hmm. Now your spine is automatically in a neutral position. You know, it's funny, even the language that we use sometimes affects these things, you know, the, the phrasing of it. Uh, like you said, the evidence-based or the, they have some reservations about, you know, the term innate intelligence or subluxation and those things. You know, it's like, like we talk about tight and guarded muscles. And I wonder if there's a, and I think it was Yonda that said this, like the flaccid is the, the muscle may be tight from lack of use. Not, it's not in a guarding role. It's in a uh, lazy state. I don't know how to, how to say it differently. And, and the, the hardest, most difficult thing they can do well in a motor learning situation would the better uh, phrasing be the hardest thing they can do okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it like, doesn't, they don't even need to do it well. It doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah, uh, but that just doesn't sound as. It as doesn't. It smooth. does not have to be perfect. If if yeah. you're doing a if you're uh, pring, believe me, your pr isn't perfect. Oh yeah, like if it if it is, you're not near pr, right? Like you're now. Should your training, you know, if you're a power lifter, be close to perfect form? Yeah, because the cost is so high. And they're going to do a very low volume, and they're they're black belts. These are like the the tour PGA tour professional. That every time mm -hmm. they club face hits the ball, it's perfect. But how many of us are on the PGA tour? So to hold people to that standard, that that's why at Stanford, Gray acknowledged that he got the FMS scoring wrong. Um, he said that that people are too mesmerized about turning twos into threes. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that if he had to do it over again, he'd have eliminated the two. So the question is, I always ask people this, would the two become merged with three or is the two, and this gets to how you do rehab, or is the two merged with the one? So is imperfect now the one or, or is acceptable compensation uh, part of the three? And I think I just gave it away. It's, it's, it, one is unacceptable compensation. Right. And two is acceptable compensation. So, so obviously the answer is that it goes with the three. So if we're looking at a sandwich, it's either a poop sandwich or an okay or great sandwich. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't eat the poop sandwiches. But if, you know, even if it's bologna and cheese <laughs> on white, we're okay. But let's make it into a turkey pesto, you know, something with some heirloom tomatoes on it if we can. Well, I, you know, you, it, if it's just not efficient if you're working on mm -hmm. the twos. If you're turning twos into threes, that, 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 that is against all of the things we know about how to make maximum impact. Yeah. Maximum impact is, is when you find somebody's floor and you raise their floor. John F. Kennedy said, uh, the rising tide lifts all the boats. So Gray knew that when he, he always said, um, focus on the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. And finding the floor is the key. So the biggest problem that I have in first principles of movement 
is since we follow Yonda's teaching that every exercise is a test, it's very hard for novices to discriminate between what's a one and what's a two. Mm -hmm. So what's, you know, for the FMS, it's easy. There's only seven tests. These tests were chosen because they were, they had binary rules that, that made it pass fail at each level, whether it's a one or a two, but most tests are very soft and it's a spectrum. And so when are you at what Dan Paff at Altus would call a tipping point where it's unacceptable. And I think this is an open conversation. We all have to decide for that person, for their age, for their condition, for their chief complaint, uh, for their goals, their activities, uh, what are the things that are acceptable or unacceptable? A rower may have a different requirement than a dancer, may have a different requirement than a golfer, uh, than a person who's 75 and facing a fall risk or 85 and facing frailty or somebody who's had spine surgery or knee surgery. If each one of these people, there may be a different uh, criteria. And can we navigate the reality of, of context dependency, the social? Uh, and so, you still tip all of the biomechanical functional model. So Craig, only because we're up against the clock here, not to put you on the spot, <laughs> but number one, what is the, uh, where can people find more about your courses? I want to make sure they get this because first principles of movement.com first principles of movement spelled out F I R S T first principle. Yeah. Spelled out principles of movement.com. Okay. That URL wasn't used before, huh? I mean, you're able to get it cheap www.firstprinciples. It's only the world's <laughs> longest URL. Um, so, so for <laughs> no. the people listening, that so we're I'm at the front. A, I'm, of, I'm not a businessman, obviously. Uh, I'm yeah. not in politics, and I'm not in business. You're a philosopher Josh, who uses his that's hand. That's why. That's why it took so so many generations in chiropractic for rehab to to take hold. I know. I still. I'm I still, not a marketer. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So, so for the people listening, how could we gamify change for them as a practitioner? How could we create a motor learning situation where they'll end this year with exercise as, I'm, I was going to say end point, but it's not an end point, that they will unlock the door to exercise for every patient. I'm not I'm sure of my phrasing here, but basically by the, this time next year, that they will be using exercise as, as a gateway to that person's, uh, to their patients, a patient centered approach, like your textbook says, that will definitely incorporate exercise into their approach, not forsaking the biopsychosocial model or anything like that. But could you, could we gamify this in a way so that maybe people hit you up on, Instagram or Facebook or something and say, I blanked this many points today, right? I, uh, I'm trying to think of a way to actually integrate this from the conversation we're having into the gamification for the practitioner. So I think it's fairly simple. As most experts do. <laughs> most of the misunderstandings are because people think you have to give people a lot of exercise. You're, you're giving okay. them one or two things and you video them. You use your iPhone and then you airdrop it to people. The era of calling it homework and giving people handouts is over. Uh, people love hearing your voice coach them through the exercises uh, on the video on the phone. If they have a, a Samsung phone, uh, then use their phone. But video them doing the successful exercises. That, that, that's the number one thing. Keep it simple. Find a couple things. Give them a positive experience with movement. It, so we're going to give, send them home with, hey, uh, hey, you know, 14-year-old Craig, here's a game film of your game-winning shot when you helped us win the championship. Take this home and watch it. Absolutely. Listen, they come in, uh, they sit on your table, they, they do a seated straight leg raise. The, the, it, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable on one side versus the other. 
or their supine, you do a pat for bears or an FAI or a standing trunk flexion test. You give them a bird dog or a side plank or a squat versus the wall, and then you retest them and they feel better. You gave them a positive experience with movement. You never touch them. They attribute to themselves. The key yeah. to self management uh, is having a positive experience with movement. And that gives them the tangible hope and an achievable plan. That's my mission to give people tangible hope and an achievable plan. How do I do it? Through giving people a positive experience with movement. So the gamification of a positive experience with movement is very simple. In a unbiased way, without any dogma, agnostically, uh, find something they do well that, that is relevant or relatable. I, yeah. T- tell me if I'm off base here, but if you send any player home with their highlights, they'll watch that tape. <laughs> But if you if you send them home with the corrective <laughs> stage, right? Here's here's what you're doing wrong, and I corrected you, and you still took those three pointers wrong, and I here's how you missed those free throws. They're probably not as likely to watch that. So if we send our patients home with a highlight reel of what they were able to do that day, yes. Do you think that's the approach? You're a genius. You're you're an effing genius. Um, so if people hit so, you up on so, Facebook and said, "I highlighted five patients today." I highlighted four patients today. I highlighted 19 patients. Yeah, that's patients their self today. that's their self-care. You're coming up with their self-care. It's not a recipe. It's yeah. patient-centered. It's n equals 1. You're following scalable principles and when people take FPM they'll see there's four principles that unlock everything, make you agile in 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 different environments. Love it. But but the, at the end of the day, you're finding what works for them. But you just said something else. It's not what you what you uh It's not what you did poorly. The bottom line, though, is the next time you see them, you're doing two things. One, you're reviewing what you sent them home with. And the reason that you prescribed that was because that's what actually raised their floor. That's what actually improved what they did poorly. So what you're going to do when you see them next time is review the self-care, A, and B, review the things that were ones in the FMS scoring, review the unacceptable dysfunctions. You're always assessing the floor. You're always raising the floor. So the two things that my patients go home with as far as thoughts in their mind are one, the motion is the lotion. Here are my exercises. These are the things that help me. And two, what am I working on? I'm working on my floor. These are the things that are my floor, my toe touch, uh, my hip mobility in a shin box or a 90-90 position, um, we're highlighting the high blood pressure, the silent killers. Mm -hmm. We're finding the dysfunctions. If you don't find the floor and explain clearly to people in a simple way why their tight hamstring is related to their back pain, why their weak abdominal is related to their back pain, why their poor hip hinge is related to their knee pain, um, then you haven't done your job. So it's all about finding the floor and then giving them a prescription which raises the floor. It's a one-two punch. So simple. How hard could this be? It's I mean, it only took you it's, thir- it's 35 years of constant study and practice and screwing it up and writing a textbook and rewriting the textbook and realizing that the rewrite wasn't right. It's hard because it's, it's, it's overwhelming because yeah. anything, anything can be the floor and anything can be the exercise. There's no recipe. And everybody yeah. wants a protocol, and I only teach principles. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. I remember well, I took this Aikido class in college for some one credit thing, and I had a, Aikido attracts philosophers, and I had a philosopher for an instructor, and he said, the first day's lesson is don't get into fights. But we shall spend the next 10 years teaching you how to survive a fight. And our final lesson will be, don't get in fights. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a perfect analogy for your career, right? For everybody's career, right? Is, is the, the first lesson is the hardest to attain and spend the next uh, few decades of your career coming back to the idea of how to solve it. So anyways... Uh, like you said, the first adjustment is the most powerful. <laughs> yeah. And, and anyway. I've, been, I've spent 35 years remembering what Yonda and Levitt taught me. Yonda well, gamified and, and didn't correct. 
and I thought he did. And everybody that, that talks about Yanda thinks he's all about correcting movement patterns. And Levitt said, don't be a slave of methods. The method should serve the goals. And the goal should be the patient's goals. And, and everybody wants to be a prisoner of these methods, a slave of methods. It's, it's, it's not about that. Agility and chaos is about finding a GPS, certain principles that are scalable. Then you can be in any environment, old or young, athletic or sedentary, right. chronic pain or acute pain. It doesn't matter. Do you remember that show, uh, That's Incredible? It was like on in the... Uh -huh. 80s and they had something i remember they had this guy on it took like his record was like 503 free throws in, made in a row and they're like that's amazing and at, at the end of it fran tarkenton's like wow you should be in the nba and the guy said looked at fran he said no fran i don't play basketball i just do free throws and i think that's a protocol and the guy realizes he you know he's good at the single protocol but there's no way he can do that in context so anyways, well, Craig, this has been awesome. I, I, I wish I could sit here for another eight hours and talk to you. I feel like my, my Vegas. brain is... Vegas, baby. <laughs> yeah, my brain is hurting. I might be bald from the next time you see me because from the growth from this conversation alone, it might have pushed my brain so hard that the hair follicles ejected as well uh, just to make extra space in my no, head. No, we're going to make the hard easy, Josh. This, this isn't about making it hard. This is... True strength, according to Pavel Satseline, is when you make the heart easy. Yeah. Anybody who's overcomplicating it, it's already complicated. Let's try to find a new oh. paradigm where, where we're more efficient. We're all overwhelmed with all this information. Yeah. Let's make it yeah. simpler. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Oh, one thing I wanted to do. Uh, we never brought him up, but I think <laughs> one of the, the learning lessons I had last year or in the last two years I was blown away and you're the only guy I know who knows of this individual. This is like talking about knowing somebody who was cool long before everybody realized it. Matt Barrink, I think is an uh, incredible whew, high level thinker mm. and high level trainer who I don't think uh, the world knows about yet, but I have a feeling, you know, in a few years he'll, he'll be well, well known. So uh, I want to give a shout out to him cause he's, he's a smart cookie. He's in charge of the, EFTI curriculum for Equinox coaches. Yeah, which is fantastic. He's, uh, un he's a very soft-spoken guy who has more skill in his fingertips than the rest of us have in our, in our frames. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we were able to uh, highlight him because uh, he's, he impressed me in the last couple of years. So anyways, Craig, so firstprinciplesofmovement.com. People can find your course there uh, where you make the complex simple and uh, the simple exciting, I'm sure. And uh, the third edition of your textbook, Rehab of the Spine, has recently been released. If they bring that book to your First Principles of Movement course, will you sign it for them? Yeah, I'll sign it in Vegas, too. There you go, at, at Parker, uh, Parker Vegas. And that's in February, right? I, I hope to be there. Yeah, I want to I wanna learn from Annie and, and, and Jan. Yeah, well, don't, don't get in the trap of gamification to be stuck down on the craps table <laughs> chasing, <laughs> chasing yourself. When one is in Vegas, one doesn't sleep. So there's time for everything. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, Craig, this has been a slice of heaven. I appreciate your time this morning and happy, uh, happy new year again to you. Happy new year. Thank you for inviting me, Josh. It's been awesome. I appreciate Great. it. And for those listening, as I always say, go out there, maximize your license and live the life you dream of. Thanks a lot, Craig. Thanks so much for checking out these videos. I hope they're useful. We'll cover things like rehab, exercise, business model, progressions, layout, everything else that helps you build a clinic. So if you're interested, you can click here, there, here, here, or anywhere to get more videos just like this. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you soon.